Welcome to the Brain Technical Beyond Ablation Panel at the 7th International Symposium on Focus Ultrasound. My name is Nathan McDonald, and I will be the moderator for this session. We will be hearing presentations from Jean-Francois Abri from the French National Center for Scientific Research, Elisa Conifagu from Columbia University, Lennart Verhagen from the Donders Institute for Brain Cognition Behavior at Radboud University, and Xian Xu from the University of Michigan. Uh, the speakers will be discussing a variety of topics on highlighting the potential to, for uses of focus ultrasound beyond thermal ablation. Um, topics will include drug delivery and neuromodulation. Following these presentations, we will have a live panel discussion with the presenters. Please be sure to enter your questions in the chat box. Thank you for joining this session and the presentations will begin in just a moment. Hi, I'm Zhen Xu from University of Michigan, and today I will talk about hysotripsy for brain applications. So focus ultrasound has been shown to uh, have many applications in the brain. Transcranial MRI-guided focus ultrasound thermal ablation has been approved by FDA to treat essential tremor, and uh, a focus ultrasound brain uh, opening has also been shown um, to be able to uh, treat many diseases in the brain. However, current transcranial MRI-guided focus ultrasound has a limitation in terms of the treatment location and the volume because of the skull heating. So it's limited to treat mostly just a central region of the brain and a small volume. Um, in comparison, hysterotripsy actually uses uh, cavitation to generate uh, tissue disruption, liquefy the target tissue into the acellular debris. And in the brain specifically, we actually use a very low duty cycle that's actually smaller than 0.1% to minimize the skull heating. And that allows us to be able to uh, effectively ablate a wide range of locations and also treat large volume through the skull in the brain. So our study have shown that uh, through excised human skull, we were able to treat a wide range of locations and the volume. So in this image is shown a three centimeter diameter volume of uh, ex vivo bovine brain was treated through excised human skull within 30 minutes. And then this image is showing actually a tissue mimicking phantom within the excised human skull where hysotripsy was able to treat deep locations uh, as well as locations close to the surface of the skull. And in this case, as close as five millimeter. And the temperature increase uh, in the skull surface was maintained within four degrees. Since hysotripsy actually mechanically break down the tissue, there was a concern that hysotripsy would actually induce excessive bleeding and edema. So we have conducted an in vivo study in the pig brain for safety investigation. And the in vivo safety study shows that we have generated different types of ablation zones, lesions in the brain from single lesions to great grids of single lesions, continuous lesions, and even block M lesions. And the MRI image uh, immediately after treatment and up to 70 hour, for 72 hours after treatment, as well as the morphology uh, have shown that there is actually no excessive bleeding uh, and edema uh, beyond the actually targeted ablation zone. And this is the first evidence of showing the in vivo safety of hysotripsy brain treatment. Uh, recently, we have constructed a two transcranial hysotripsy system, or actually uh, we call Gen2 system, or, where one is MRI guided hysotripsy transcranial hysotripsy system, and it has uh, 370 elements. Uh, 30 centimeter diameter and is a hemispherical transducer array. Uh, then we also have another one that's actually constructed as a neural navigation system guided hysotripsy array with the same geometry uh, 360 elements array. 
And this array is able to generate uh, in the free field up to 150 megapascal. And then through the human skull, uh, where we were able to generate uh, uh, as high as uh, six, 70 megapascal. And then the steering range through the skull uh, with aberration correction. And steering range through the skull uh, with, with this, uh, you know, when we calculate the steering range, we actually calculate it as a steering range where we can still exceed the cavitation intrinsic threshold through the skull. So that steering range using this array uh, is 55 by 57 by 64 millimeter. So with this newly con uh, constructed MI guided transcranial histotripsy system, we have conducted uh, experiments in the in vivo porcine brain through excised human skull. So the MI image is showing here that the array was placed down here, treating through the uh, human skull and into the porcine brain, where part of the porcine skull was removed to provide the acoustic opening on the skin is sutured back. Uh, so the brain is intact. And then we were able to actually generate uh, effective uh, ablation zones through the human skull into the in vivo porcine brain. We also did some in initial study showing that histotripsy actually also induce uh, immune stimulation in the brain, uh, where histotripsy reduced the uh, immune suppressive minoid cell population, uh, and the active um, and the activated in free gamma uh, is actually three orders of magnitude higher in the histotripsy treated cases compared to the control. Uh, in addition. Uh, we have immunohistology showing that in the treated tumor case where we actually treat part of the tumor and part of the, uh, actually this is in a mouse uh, glioma model. So part of the untreated tumor, a week later showing shrunken nu nuclei and tumor cells and uh, decreased uh, mitotic index indicating uh, their uh, the tumor cells are dying uh, compared to this is actually in the normal looking uh, normal looking uh, tumor cells. Um, so I would like to acknowledge our collaborators uh, here at the University of Michigan and at the Histosonics and the Focus Ultrasound Foundation uh, and the training and the staff who actually conducted the study that reported here and our funding support. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lynette Verhagen uh, from the Donders Institute at the Rutbaud University in the Netherlands. And I'm using low intensity uh, focused ultrasound for neuromodulation in primates, including humans. And today I wanna to talk to you about some of the clinical potential of using ultrasound for neuromodulation. And specifically, we find this potential in the treatment of brain disorders. And altogether, they affect about one in four people. And this really, there's a major role for focused ultrasound to play here. These disorders have an enormous personal and societal cost. I mean, of course, you can imagine what it means for patients, but, but even at the larger level, I think there's about 5% of the gross domestic product. In fact, it is the total cost of brain disorders. Now, focused ultrasound at high intensity as an ablative technique is already revolutionizing uh, the treatment options here. But ablative ultrasound is relevant for perhaps only 3% of the patient population. And that means that we have an enormous number of patients who could benefit from focused ultrasound at other modalities and levels. Now, that's the opportunity I'm going to talk about today. And that's also where low intensity ultrasonic neuromodulation enters. Now, in this field, we are able to, uh, with millimeter resolution, even deep in the brain, modulate neural activity. And um, in what we nowadays see is that there are many different researchers who are working and discussing if these effects are either uh, exciting activity or inhibiting neural activity. 
I now I want to argue that actually we should move away from that vision on these two domains. We shouldn't be thinking about exciting or inhibiting, and actually we shouldn't be thinking about modulating activity at all. We should be switching our ideas to modulating plasticity. So uh, there were two points that I would like to make. The first is on exciting and inhibiting. In fact, the effects of sonication are less a property of the protocol parameters themselves and more of their interaction with the neuronal circuit. So the acoustic radiation force of low intensity ultrasound can trigger a molecular cascade and lead to spiking activity. But if that elicits activity in an inhibitory GABAergic neural circuit, the end results are inhibitory, right? It, no matter what the protocol would be. Now, um, <clears throat> similarly, if we um, are, are thinking about the effects of ultrasound for clinical relevance, I would like to invite people to move away from thinking about switching um, uh, or, or flicking a switch. This works really well when we're discussing tremor symptoms and again for ablative surgery, but it doesn't generalize so well to uh, other modalities, especially to psychiatric disorders. Now, together with uh, some actually of the other people on this panel, including Jean-Francois Aubry, we've worked on novel protocols that have longer lasting effects where we can modulate activity for up to an hour. But if we modulate activity for up to an hour or a little bit longer, in fact, we're modulating plasticity, right? The ultrasonic stimulation has already stopped. And we're thinking about these protocols as opening up a window of opportunity where the brain can retrain and rehabilitate. And in that sense, if you combine it with therapy or actually with engaging in daily life, even shorter ultrasonic protocols can have enormous long lasting life changing effects. Now, we can learn a lot here from what's already available in other non-invasive brain stimulation techniques. Consider, for example, magnetic or electric stimulation. Um, let, let's stay on the magnetic stimulation. TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, is an approved and proven treatment for depression. Um, but these treatments, they work on stimulating actually the cortex of the brain. And yet they are even more effective nowadays than medication often is. But it has taken us 25 years to get there. Right, that's an enormous amount of time. So we can learn from what has happened there in building these treatments to now applying it to ultrasonic modulation. And something that we've learned is actually that we need to work together with the brain. Rather than overriding it with an arbit artificial signal, we need to entrain it in the physiology of the brain. For example, stimulating it in the brain rhythm itself. These protocols have a lasting effect. And secondly, it is tremendously important that we think about this again as a plastics um, model. Consider treatments for a stim brain stimulation treatments for obsessive compulsive disorder. The effects don't start immediately, but they take up to three months to arise, right? So that's also how we should design our experiments in clinical trials. So we can make this work, but only if we work together, and especially if we work together with the brain. Thank you. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank the FIRST Foundation for giving me the opportunity to participate to this panel. I will focus in my introductory talk about the modulation of brain activity with two different techniques. First technique to modulate brain activity is what I would call direct ultrasound neurostimulation. In that case, we would emit pulsed ultrasound into the head of the animal and here is an example of a tail movement that was induced on a rat when we were um, emitting ultrasound. And the movement of the tail uh, occurred only when ultrasound was on. When ultrasound was turned off, uh, the tail would uh, go back to its uh, resting position. You can find more details in this uh, paper that we published in uh, Medical Physics. Second, a uh, way to um, uh, modulate brain activity is to um, first open the broadband barrier and then uh, inject a neuroactive agent. Uh, and um, this was uh, first performed by Nathan McDonald and his team. And you can see here uh, an example of BBB opening. 
that is assessed here by gadolinium extravasation at the location where ultrasound were uh, targeted. And once the BBB is open, uh, they injected uh, GABA uh, intravenously. And you can see uh, that they induced a suppression of the somatosensory evoked potentials. And the suppression was uh, actually proportional to the amount of drug that was injected to the animal. Those two uh, illustrations were performed in rats, but uh, there's been extensive work also in extending those results to non-human primates. The uh, first um, um, experiments that we performed on non-human primates uh, were performed in 2013 in our lab, where actually we induced a behavioral change on those monkeys. And more precisely, we changed the latency time during a visual motor task. In your case, it was an anti task, and we could change the uh, this time significantly. Um, more recently, we also slightly changed the, the ultrasound parameters, and we were able to induce a long-lasting effect on primates. Uh, by long-lasting, I mean more than 20 minutes and actually even more than half an hour. And this time was uh, long enough for us to, uh, to do some uh, functional MRI acquisitions. Uh, and you can see here the different effects of the, uh, the ultrasound. Um, and this depends on the positive of, or negative coupling of the target with the rest of the brain. Uh, we, this work was done in collaboration with Lennart Verhagen, and he might give you more details as he is also a member of, uh, of this panel. And more recently, we uh, also opened the BBB on non-human primates and injected uh, GABA, so very similar to what Nathan McDonald did on, on rats. And uh, very similarly, actually, we also uh, observed uh, uh, an effect that is proportional to the amount of uh, drug that is injecting injected to the um, animals. To conclude, I would like to um, give you a short overview of the devices that have uh, been uh, developed for uh, neuromodulation. And you see here a wide variety of, uh, of devices. And basically, it depends if uh, those devices are used on rodents, or on primates, or on humans. And we can discuss this in more details if you wish. But basically, it depends uh, on the um, not only on, on the model, uh, but uh, on the animal model, but also on the location of the target, depending if you wish to, to modulate the activity uh, um, in the cortex or in deep seated areas. In that case, so depending on, on the target and depending on the model, the size, the shape and the frequency of the transducer need to be adapted. I would like to thank our support. And um, so the, the National Agency for Research, the Fondation Betancourt Schuller, the Fondation de France, and also, of course, the uh, Focused Ultrasound Foundation. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Hello everyone, my name is Elisa Conofago and I'll be talking uh, today on brain modulation and drug delivery with focus ultrasound. This is the outline of the talk. I'll be showing you three different uh, areas that we've been focusing on uh, over the past few years. The first one is focus ultrasound mediated modulation with focus ultrasound only. I'll be showing you examples of motor stimulation, sensory stimulation and vital science stimulation. The second part will be on FUS mediated modulation uh, through BBB opening, uh, blood room berry opening, which means uh, we have the uh, conjunction of focus ultrasound and micro bubbles. And I'll be focusing first on working memory enhancement that we've seen on Alzheimer's and wild type mice, and then enhancement of touch accuracy and reaction time in, uh, in non human primates. The third part will be uh, in conjunction with drug delivery through the blood room berry opening, uh, also through the focus ultrasound and micro bubbles which will entail neurotrophic protein, gene delivery in Parkinson's mice, 
uh, chemotherapeutic delivery in glioblastoma tumors, and finally, translation to humans. So this is uh, the first part with entails focused ultrasound only. The transducer is on the top here. This is the ultrasound-mediated motor response on the right limb of the mouse. And as we move the transducer uh, to the right hemisphere, uh, we see a, a, a response on the left uh, side. So the paw is actually moving on the left side. Uh, this is uh, something that we published a few years back. And we can do this uh, on the cortex, which you can see th here at minus one millimeter uh, deep in the, in the, in the brain. Um, but we can also do subcortically, and we've seen that you can have oculo, uh, oculomotor uh, movement, but also uh, pupil dilation as a result uh, with, uh, when you uh, go subcortically. We've also seen some uh, heart rate and breathing rate effects uh, that we have uh, presented on uh, more recently. Uh, by having a more sustained, uh, over minutes, uh, focus ultrasound uh, on uh, anesthetized mice. And we can see every time we pulse the ultrasound, you have heart rate changes and breathing rate that accompany these heart rate changes. Um, another way that you can modulate uh, the brain is through the blood room barrier opening. The blood room barrier is what separates the vasculature of the brain from the surrounding parenchyma. Uh, it's very important for uh, delivering drugs and in assessing safety, uh, we have seen that you can also uh, induce cell modulation. Now, this is the way that we actually do it. We have the blood vessel here uh, that you can see in red and the vertical uh, ultrasound beam that modulates the actual action of the thigh junctions and the blood room barrier as a whole. And we allow here uh, molecules that can be the drug contrast agents or whatever is actually flowing uh, at the right size, a molecular weight uh, that can finally reach uh, cells in the parenchyma, such as neurons. We can assess this uh, with MRI and we can identify regions that we have opened through the gadolinium uh, enhancement that normally does not penetrate the barrier and assess safety with T2 weighted MRI. Um, and uh, in Alzheimer's mice, uh, we have uh, shown that uh, we can actually enhance the working memory. This is in the Morris water maze uh, in uh, uh, transgenic mice uh, with uh, both amyloid and tau. So we enhance uh, the actual uh, working memory so they're able to find the platform in the Morris water maze. But we can also enhance further uh, the wild type uh, mice uh, that uh, are non-transgenics. Uh, so from their uh, working memory that's already working but even enhance it some more. And that's uh, uh, significant uh, from a transgenic uh, FU with focus ultrasound versus sham. And the same thing, uh, wild type uh, without FUS on the left uh, with FUS uh, on the right. Uh, and we have seen that the higher the blood and burial vo uh, opening volume, the higher uh, the uh, area of uh, uh, cognition, the uh, rate of cognition improvement. That also translates in non-human primates. This is an MRI reconstruction showing you the actual uh, striatum targeted here uh, by focus ultrasound. And this is where we actually open in orange. And we have seen the non-human primates, you can get also enhancement of uh, attached panel response as the, the actual uh, animal is actually asked to have a cue and a target. Um, and we, uh, we test on motivation and, uh, uh, and decision accuracy as, as well as response time and we're able to enhance both uh, with high reward and low reward um, that shows motivation as a result of focus ultrasound versus uh, focus ultrasound uh, uh, without focus ultrasound. And then we look at uh, the histology of these uh, monkeys and we're able to see that there is a neurogenesis in the regions where we targeted. Um, and in fact, if you, if you look at two days after, that's actually significant. Uh, 18 days later, uh, that effect has gone uh, away uh, and you're back to normal. But uh, this, uh, we think, may be uh, one of the reasons why we can have, we can have behavioral uh, improvement. The final thing I want to touch on is also drug delivery through the blood and berry opening. Uh, in early Parkinson's, we're able to have uh, neuro restoration up to 76% of the dendrites with gene delivery and up to 50% um, in uh, the terminals of the dopaminergic neuron with protein delivery. And in the case of glioblastomas, we're able to actually have uh, the infusion of a toposide, which is a chemotherapy that treats the tumor uh, by at least 27% uh, median survival as a result uh, increase, as a result of higher, um, of reduced tumor growth. 
Uh, this is a clinical focused ultrasound system that we're ready to translate to the clinic. We have one ID uh, that is uh, approved for Alzheimer's patients and uh, uh, we're starting next month and another IND uh, for pediatric point and glioma, which is also uh, approved and we're starting next year. So in conclusion, we've shown the focus ultrasound alone can stimulate motor and sensory responses. Uh, focus ultrasound with microbubble can induce pleurimbury opening that can modulate the behavior in both small and large animals, including Alzheimer's. Um, and uh, we also can facilitate protein and gene delivery that can induce uh, neuro restoration up by up to 76% in Parkinsonian mice uh, and uh, facilitate as well chemotherapeutic delivery in glioblastoma mice. We continue with uh, modern sensor responses and mechanistic understanding uh, of uh, what we can induce in animals. Uh, we can combine focus ultrasound with electroencephalography in human volunteers. Um, and then, uh, as I said, we continue with blood berry opening in Alzheimer's patients to determine uh, potential cognitive amelioration. We want to thank our sponsors, the team, and you for your attention. Uh, session. Um, I'm Nathan McDonald, and I'm um, just going to get started. Um, I'm going to talk first uh, with Jen Zhu about uh, histotripsy. Um, and she gave a very nice talk uh, overviewing what they're working on for histotripsy in the brain. I'm going to start with some, some technical questions. Uh, first from the chat, uh, we had a question. Uh, if, if you wanted to defocus the spot to treat a larger volume per with one sonication, how, how large do you think you might be able to make that and achieve histotripsy? So um, if we want to treat a large volume, I would actually prefer not to defocus the spot, but use uh, either electrical focal steering um, or mechanically move the uh, focus to <clears throat> treat a larger volume uh, so that we can actually keep the accuracy uh, and defocusing would actually uh, reduce accuracy. So our current system, transcranial system, um, the electronic focal steering range when we tested through the excised human skull uh, is about 50 millimeter uh, in, yeah, 50 millimeter also. And, and while we can still keep the focal pressure above the cavitation threshold. Um, so using electrical focal steering alone, we can already treat five centimeter diameter. Uh, and it's possible to use a mechanical movement to, to treat a larger volume. So it's, by the end, it's a really come down to the treatment time. How long can we, you know, how, how, how long, how much, how much time do we have in order to treat a big volume? And also the biological response, there's a, it's not clear like if you treat a really large volume, you have all those uh, acellular debris sitting in the brain, how the body would react. So there's also a biological response uh, um, how big a volume we can treat in one session. Um, when you're, you're thinking about doing uh, tumor treatments, um, how close do you think you could get to the skull, um, both on the sort of the outer part of the, in the cortical area and also deep where reflections might be an issue? So when we perform the uh, treatment envelope study using the excised human skull and, and the phantom, um, the closest we got so far is a five millimeter uh, from the uh, skull surface. And the, at that time point, uh, the limitation is actually not heating of the skull because we are using um, duty cycle below 0.01%. However, uh, the limitation comes from prefocal cavitation. So at that point, we start getting cavitation on the skull surface. I have a couple questions about uh you know, sort of risks of the, the potential risks that you, you know, that you have to show before going forward. Um, first, have you, have you thought about maybe trying to uh, purposely induce bleeding just to understand what the risk may be, so maybe alter your treatment parameters? And second, have you tried targeting uh, right adjacent to a larger blood vessel um, and just to show that, that you don't see any uh, hemorrhage or, or anything that's delayed? Yeah, so um, we actually um, have just kind of finished a, a really initial feasibility study in the pig brain, in vivo pig brain, uh, where we uh, use the histotripsy treating through the excised human skull guided by MRI 
in the in vivo brain. And in uh, the brain, there were cases where we actually didn't intentionally, but uh, did include vessels within the target area and we did see some bleeding. Um, so there is bleeding when you hit a vessel um, at a high enough of pressure where you potentially actually could disrupt the vessel. And in those cases, we see some bleeding, but it's not like excessive bleeding. Uh, and uh, it's interesting because uh, in um, other organs where we actually tried some bleeding studies were, uh, for example, in the prostate, uh, in the Kenyan prostate, we tried a study where we inject heparin into, <clears throat> um, into trying to induce bleeding. And then we treated uh, um, the prostate with histotripsy. And in those cases, it seems like uh, uh, we actually induce some coagulation effects uh, with the cavitation. Uh, and such that we, uh, even with a uh, heparin injection, we didn't see uh, excessive bleeding. Um, so there is a, it's certainly a topic that needs further investigation. Uh, the initial results uh, indicate, seem to indicate that if we hit a vessel, uh, there is a risk of disrupting the vessel, uh, but we haven't seen evidence of excessive bleeding. Right, thank you. Um, I think uh, I'm going to move on to uh, talk a little bit about neuromodulation. And I had a uh, question for Leonard. Um, you gave a very interesting talk about uh, neuromodulation. And um, you talked about use, you know, thinking about fuss as not being stimulative or blocking brain function, but as uh, sort of modulating brain plasticity. Um, this is maybe not a fair question, but how do, how do you think that works? So... <clears throat> First, um, I, my, I have a history in non-invasive brain stimulation using electromagnetic tools. And um, there it started out with really simplified ideas that you activate a region or you inhibit it. And now, um, 20 or 30 years later, the world is a lot more complex and we are completely revising this. And I think we're going to see the same if we're talking about another non-invasive brain stimulation tool. And particularly when in relevance to psychiatric disorders, um, you, you might have protocols that uh, induce plasticity, for example, long-term potentiation, long-term depression, but also think about astrocyte excitation for synaptic support um, that would actually change the, the binding between or, or the, the signal transduction across neurons. These can, can last longer, and especially in the psychiatric domain, uh, that can be very relevant because in some cases, a circuit disorder actually means that the circuit is, is locked and has a hard time retraining or rehabilitating. What you would like to induce, maybe even with external stimulation, is that it's becoming more susceptible to learning, right? And we have a few protocols um, in electric and electromagnetic stimulation that can help to boost these downstream signaling cascades that lead to long-term potentiation and depression. And they actually seem to be uh, especially beneficial um, for allowing retraining and learning. These are the kind of protocols that have proven successful in that domain, and uh, I'm keen to see if they work here as well. You, this may be a sort of a naive question, but um, you know, plasticity plays an important role in recovery from stroke or brain injury. Do you think that these sorts of effects might have a role to play uh, in, in rehabilitation? Yes, a major role, in fact. Um, I see that uh, as a very large field. Uh, and, and stroke itself has um, a lot of opportunities, uh, both as a model disease because um, you may know where it is and there's a long rehabilitation trajectory. And uh, again, using electromagnetic tools, we ha have gained a lot of experience why you would like to modulate the circuit. For example, stroke is over here and we'd like to have recompensation in another brain region. Uh, so we're, we're, uh, where we're developing those. And now it will be very exciting to start using ultrasound, uh, building on these foundations. Um, it, it, I, I see that as a major way forward, yeah. Right. Um, in one of the things that has always been a question for me doing, you know, these functional neurosurgery for tremor in particular, is that in a certain subset of patients, you know, several months after the treatment, that the tremor returns. And yeah. I've wondered maybe if it's just plasticity bringing it in. Is there, do you think that we could use ultrasound to sort of reduce plasticity? So, okay, great question. <laughs> so um, if we consider, for example, the work of Peter Brown from Oxford um, using, uh, in that case, transcranial alternating current stimulation to try to suppress the tremor, 
by stimulating it in an oscillation, what we see that the circuit is doing is it's trying to escape the exogenous imposed um, oscillation. So the tremor keeps on popping back up and you need to continuously follow this. Mm. And those kind of adaptive protocols uh, might also be very relevant in, um, uh, in tremor on a longer time scale in, in plasticity when there is reorganization in the circuit and the tremor uh, comes back up. Think, for example, about the role of the cerebellum uh, in this tremor circuit. Uh, and that, that might have direct connections to primary motor cortex as well, bypassing even the, um, uh, the thalamus, the vim in the thalamus. So we have shown uh, in Parkinson's patients that if we reduce with TMS, uh, the dorsal premotor area, that actually we have compensation in the cerebellum uh, lasting longer. Well, these happen over a longer time scale. And that's one of the reasons why for those patients, I think maybe even adaptive lower intensity neuromodulation can be helpful um, when it, the tremor escapes the ablation, for example. It's interesting. For psychiatric disorders, do you think that there are there are particular disorders that would be more uh, amenable or focus ultrasound treat than others? So we, we haven't really touched on the full understanding of the mechanisms here of either both the disorders and ultrasound. So um, what, what most people are doing is they're saying, well, this is an, a, a disease where I know the circuit relatively well, where I can stratify the patients, and where I have other treatments that have proven successful, and those are the ones that I'm building upon. So you're looking for circuits that you know that other treatments are working, but you would like to improve upon those. And that means that many people are in psychiatry are, for example, considering uh, obsessive compulsive disorder where the circuit is really well mapped. It's a little bit more complex in depression because of the enormous variation in, in patients. So you, you need to clearly stratify those to know which circuit to target. Um, and anxiety, uh, especially post-traumatic stress disorder. Again, we know the circuit a little bit better on the hippocampal amygdala connections to subgenual ACC. So okay, there you. we have targets. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna move on to Dr. Aubrey. Um, and you gave a very nice talk about the, the system you've set up uh, doing neuromodulation in non-human primates, alert non-human primate. Um, just first, um, one of the, the chat uh, had a question about on um, one of your studies, you, your, your monkey B appeared to be less responsive. And they were curious about what factors influence susceptibility to neuromodulation with this technique, or is that known? Um, so I saw the questions, I went back to my presentation to, to know what monkey B <laughs> was referring okay. to. And so it, it, it has to do with the um, BBB opening actually to deliver GABA. I see. And um, those were, I would say, proof of concept on, on monkeys. And we, uh, we don't know exactly, we did not quantify the amount of GABA that actually went into the brain. Mm -hmm. So that might be the, the main difference. I, I, um, this, there should be an ongoing work on this um, topic and we need to reproduce those results. And um, I think quantifying GABA would be a very important uh, point. That. And we were also limited in the um, the quantity of GABA that we would administer to the monkey. Uh, in our case, we did not have much data on safety issues, how, how much GABA we could inject per kilogram for the monkeys. So we injected way less, for example, uh, Nathan, you, you did the, the, the proof of concept on, the, on rats. Mm -hmm. and, and it was, in your case, much more efficient in, in terms of uh, of blocking the activity, but also the amount of GABA that you injected was, was much higher. So, so I think there's some room for improvement in optimizing the, the quantity of GABA that we inject and in checking really how much is actually going into the brain. So um, what uh, I, I was wondering if you could discuss uh, a bit um, what you think might be the main safety concerns or, or how we would establish safety guidelines for neuromodulation and maybe discuss a little bit about the role you think or the importance of the role of the you know, acoustic simulations are for the neuromodulation field. Um, first, it, it, this is definitely not an easy answer. Yeah. Uh, and and Lennart is doing a great job trying to have everyone all together. And we are currently discussing about what should be safety guidelines for, for neuromodulation. There's currently a wide range of first repetition frequency, frequency, 
uh, peak pressure that is currently being used in, in the studies. And uh, we, in terms of, uh, in, of physics, uh, there's a continuum uh, between neuromodulation and ablation or histotripsy, depending on if you play with the peak pressure uh, amplitude, then you will end up with histotripsy. And then if you play with the uh, duration of the pulse, you will end up with inducing thermal lesioning if you wish. So we need to set boundaries there. Um, and so far, of course, people uh, trying to achieve acoustic neuromodulation used uh, very low total energy. And so, so far we have a lot of um, uh, reports that, that uh, tends to confirm that it's completely safe, uh, but we need a consensus there and we need to set boundaries. And we will have to pay uh, attention to the peak pressure. So kind of a, a mechanical index and also thermal index or, or maximum temperature, but we need to consider both and, and we need to establish that. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to uh, Alisa. Um, a question from the, the chat. Um, when you were doing your BBB opening studies in the brain tumor model, um, what was the temporal window of the, the FUS protocol? I'm not sure exactly what they mean, but maybe you do. Thank you for that confused question. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I'm assuming they want, they want to understand uh, when we injected and how long. Uh, we were looking at the effect. So um, this is actually in collaboration. I have to uh, say that uh, we're collaborating very closely with radiation oncology at Columbia. And this is a, a newest study uh, that we just published on uh, glioblastoma. So um, this is a new area for us, but um, the idea was to use a toposide, uh, which is a generic drug has been used in glioblastoma um, uh, unsuccessfully because of the lar larger doses that are used uh, for to curb the growth, uh, but they lead to uh, extreme side effects. Um, so we use a dose that is has been shown to be safe, but uh, and, um, not as efficacious because you have to lower the dosage for side effects. So that was five meg per keg. And, um, and we've shown that the survival um, increases by uh, five days on the average in the mouse, one mouse actually just was extended for two uh, months, uh, if not more, uh, the survival um, and uh, the actual uh, growth of the tumor was also halved, uh, so a cut by half um, as a result of opening and delivering. Um, so as far as the drug administration, if that was a question about the temporal, mm -hmm. uh, it was done pretty much right after the opening. Uh, the toposide was administered at five milligrams per uh, kilo uh, right after. You also uh, discussed some of your work in uh, neuromodulation in your talk. And one of the issues that has come up over the past couple of years is that you know, an auditory artifact that can occur with neuromodulation, especially in small animals. Uh, can you describe how you control for that in your experiments? Yeah, this is a question uh, that we had to deal, deal with because uh, obviously in the whole neuromodulation, ultrasound neuromodulation world, um, there was uh, a couple of papers that uh, made it, um, uh, the, uh, the show that uh, auditory effects are actually generated uh, through streaming of the auditory fluid. Um, so we have uh, a study that's currently pending uh, in revision where we actually had uh, a lot of different groups. We had the ambient group. So ambient, that means uh, just uh, you know, the, the regular noise in the lab when you do a mouse experiment. Um, then we had a speaker, um, another sham where we actually had that uh, similar frequency and intensities that we use in ultrasound. Um, and, long, and then our actual experiment with FUS modulation um, and we showed that the latency is nowhere near. There are some, some, sometimes some effects uh, and there, are, there is some uh, motor uh, movement, but random, uh, and the latency is nowhere near uh, what we actually find with FUS. So absolutely we have to have groups. I think I would definitely uh, say that there are, uh, we have to have a separate group with just uh, auditory noise. Um, but uh, it definitely is not the mechanism in our hands. And we have also peripheral nerve uh, modulation that we found and we uh, presented that uh, yesterday in the session, uh, the pain session. 
uh, and the auditor is nowhere near <laughs> the peripheral nerves. So, uh, so definitely it's, 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 no, it's part of the noise, but not the mechanism. Great, so we're, we have about one minute left. Um, and I'd hoped I was gonna ask you about one of the more exciting things you showed in your talk was you know, the potentially to improve cognition after BBB opening. I'm not yeah. gonna make you try to answer that in 20 seconds of what's going on. Um, but uh, I, I'm curious what, what you think your next steps are. I know that you've started a clinical trial and you've done patients in Alzheimer's patients. Yes. Uh, and uh, what, do you, what are your next steps? And, and are you looking still at Parkinson's patients? We are, and I'm gonna to try to answer all of that. Uh, we're very excited, we just did our first Alzheimer's patients, and I know you've been there before with patients, but for us it's like, you know, it's just a new world. And uh, the modulation aspect for, for wild types and normal cognition is also something uh, that we're excited about. I'm sorry, we're, we're out of time. So thank you, thank you everybody.